This is the 007 Debriefings. I'm Intelligence Officer Wiz. And I'm Weapon Specialist Zero. Zero. How's it going today? A little exhausted from my day job, but it's all right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, the things that we do to protect king and country it is exhausting. I agree. Zero, we're here today to review the latest file from James Bond's a Cinematic Adventures, which is You Only Live Twice. This one is an interesting one. Basically, this is the last one that Connery did before he left and then came back with Diamonds Are Forever. And what's interesting is even though this is the one that after this Connery left, this doesn't get a lot of, I would say, negative feedback from it or like a negative backlash from it. I don't hear a lot of positive things either, but it just seems like a lot of the negative attention goes to the next movie we're going to watch, which is On Her Majesty's Secret Service. As far as this one, it is kind of interesting that you mentioned just that people don't really seem to have a negative opinion on this one. Things seem to be generally positive. I think the only thing that I've seen as far as criticisms go is that the Bond girls in this movie are not really perfect on the chemistry. It The chemistry feels kind of weak, but mm. I think that's really the only thing that I've read criticism-wise about this particular film. I've got a bunch of criticism on this one. That's why I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I would say I'm asking this as well, but uh, there's probably a very good reason as to why the, the Bond girl chemistry is not that great, but we'll get into that. So why don't we get into our mission objectives, and we're going to start off with, as we usually do, which is 007. Of course, it's James Bond, played by Sean Connery. Zero, I think the one word I would have to use to describe Connery's performance in this is disinterested. It definitely seems like Connery is just kind of there to do his job. There, There's some clever one-liners here and there, but they almost seem like they're sort of laid out for him instead of just sort of something that Connery sort of makes it feel like it just flows off the cuff in some way. So, yeah, I could say that dispassionate is probably a good way to put it. All in all, it's a serviceable performances bond, but it definitely feels like the passion that Connery once had is definitely sort of leaving him at this point. Yeah, and I think a lot of this also has to do with the script, because everything about Bond is a little more muted. The charm is muted, the swagger is kind of subdued, confidence that he usually has is a lot less pronounced. It really feels like he's sleepwalking throughout this entire film, and that he's just, I think you said already, going through the motions as the film goes on in this. I will say this, though. I think one of the funniest aspects of this film is Bond going undercover as a Japanese fisherman, and everyone just buys into it. Just give him short hair and bush your eyebrows, and then there you go. <laughs> Bond is Japanese now. I'm like, wait, hold up a second. <laughs> he, he doesn't sound Japanese at all. What are you talking about? Like, what, what Japanese person do you know has a Scottish accent? If you do, I want to meet him, by the way. <laughs> that whole piece, it seemed like it would be a gimmick you would see in a Mission Impossible movie rather than a Bond movie, so I was just like, what in the hell? Okay, so they're putting him under a surgical procedure to, to turn him Japanese, but yet they have not trained him language-wise to sound like a Japanese person. How the fuck does this make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, this seems like a concept that should have been ripe for the picking for Austin Powers in this, because like, I could just imagine a scene in Austin Powers where all Austin Powers has to do is wear a kimono, and then suddenly everyone thinks he's Japanese, and he's like, wait, what? <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> That's essentially what happens. Like, absolutely no one in the, in the fishing village is like, yo, that guy's taller than us, and he sounds Scottish. What is going on here? Everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, I don't even think they gave him a name. That's the other thing that I don't, I don't get. Like, if he's undercover, he should have a name, right? So, like. Yeah. Which, it was just kind of, he married, he married one of the pearl diving girls. So that's, that's it. Here's the thing, though. I think there are two different types of people who enjoy Bond movies. The ones that I, I think I'm more like, where it seems more realistic, but there's a little bit of fantastical elements in it, where it's still kind of believable. And then there is the goofy, kind of funny, and kind of fantastical Bonds 
that I think some people do like. And this is definitely one of those types of films. And they might like it because, oh, it's just good fun. It's just, it's hilarious. It's goofy. It's kind of funny in that way. Some people do enjoy this. I'm not one of them, but I can see why maybe someone would watch this and go, you just can't take this seriously. This is just fun. In some ways, it seems a little goofier than a normal Bond movie in my mind. And I think that's why... In some ways, I was taken out of it. And I'll be honest, I had to watch this one twice just to make sure that I didn't miss anything because oh, no. there were just some moments where I was just like, this just seems like real goofy and all over the place. It takes my mood out of the movie and I was just like, maybe I'm bored or I'm missing something because of just how goofy and almost cartoonish this one is. And the cartoonish bit seems to be a follow-up to, to the last movie that we watched as well too. Mm -hmm. and. I don't know, maybe just me, but I really like the Bond movies that, that are a bit more on the serious side, and this one, um, because of its kind of goofiness with some of the action scenes as well, too, is just like, ugh, did I misremember something? Ah, shit, I'm gonna have to rewatch this again, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Mind Bond being funny. There are funny aspects to Bond in all the Bond movies, so I don't entirely mind a little humor once in a while, but yeah, when it gets to goofiness like this is where I'm like, Eh, it's not really for me in, in this aspect, but Connery's fine as Bond in this movie. It's his worst performance as Bond, I would say, but it's not bad. It's just really obvious that he's kind of grown tired of the role at this point. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It definitely has the vibe of, I'm just phoning it in to get a check. Just just let me get the hell out of here, guys. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's definitely what it felt like in this. Okay, so why don't we move on from 007, get right to the villains. Zero, there are like three villains in this movie. And we're going to get to the minor ones first, because I don't think there's really much to go on with these three. So the first one I'm going to go for is Mr. Osato, who's played by Teru Shimada. There's not much to this guy other than he's a corporate shark. You don't learn much. You don't really get much anything out of it other than he really is just a lackey for Spectre. With that, I think as a villain, there's not much to him in this. So he's just basically the corporate goon that is a front for Spectre in this one. And that's it. There's nothing much to him. He seems like he arranges sort of the business dealings to help Spectre with procuring supplies through his uh, chemical company. And it really just seems to be the most of it. And I think really the only big scene that he has a significant interaction is when Bond sort of strolls into Osato Chemical as sort of like a buyer. And at that point, that's when you meet uh, Osato and everything. And, and he's just kind of talking with him going, oh, uh, I see you want to try to negotiate a, a business deal with us. Okay, great, great, great. And then, you know, just sniffs out that Bond's not really who he says he is. And he's just like, all right, I need to have you have my goons go murder him because he's clearly not a buyer. He's scoping around for things. And that's pretty much it. And, of course, he unceremoniously dies right towards the end, too, by just being shot kind of point blank. It was just kind of a, all right, well, you're done. Bye. And then bang. It was yeah. just like, okay, well... That was kind of unceremonious, but sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. And the other person who kind of went the same way was Helga Brandt, who was played by Karen Dar. I'm starting to notice something about myself when it comes to the, the females in these movies. I like the ones that kind of give Bond a hard time or are kind of competitive with Bond, because I felt the same way about Helga Brandt, who's also number 11 with Inspector. But again, she's not in this much, and she meets an untimely end, just like Mr. Osato did. I, I think she's probably, of the three, the more interesting of the villains, but again, she doesn't have much to do. She outsmarts and outwits Bond at one point. But that's it. That's all she does. She's kind of set up as sort of a cleaner assassin type that if people need to be killed, then it's kind of her job to do whatever needs to be done. And yeah, I think really just the only moment we get to see some sort of display that she outwits Bond is pretty much when Bond thinks that he's got her on like the side of just changing her mind and, you know, absconding with him to spill out all of Spectre's secrets and stuff like that. She ends up kind of trapping him on the plane and going, Ha ha, sucks to be you. You're going to crash now, so bye. Yeah. <laughs> I know we had the joke in the last couple of Bond movies about uh, Bond and the magic penis, and this time it didn't work for I once. Know. I was just like, what a surprise. <laughs> it's great. Like, I thought, oh, that's great. I, 
the female characters that outsmart, outwit, or outmaneuver Bond are usually the more interesting ones. But in this case, I think she is the more interesting villain and the more interesting female in the movie, but she's dead halfway through it. It, it sucks, but I, I think she's the favorite of the villains in, in this movie. But other than that, there's not much to her. Okay, so let's get to the last villain, which is Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who's played by Donald Pleasance. He's known as number one from, from Russia with Love to the last movie that we watched, which was Thunderball. So this is the first time we actually see his face. I'm having conflicted thoughts here. I'm starting to feel like Austin Powers really screwed me when it came to Blofeld in this, because with the way he looks, he reminds me too much of Dr. Evil. But even, <laughs> but even take that away. What about Blofeld is that interesting? He's cold, he's calculated, and he's a sociopath. But other than that, he has no charm. He has nothing that's really that interesting. He looks bland as hell at times, except for the scar on his face. I think in this movie, it, he's fine, but he still looks pretty goofy, which is a problem for a villain who is supposed to be one of the most brilliant and cunning villains that Bond will ever face. If he is that specifically, you would have to think he's going to be a little more intimidating, a little more ruthless, but he just comes off as goofy. I think for me, it's the voice that he has, which just sort of puts a cartoonish caricature on him. And unfortunately, I too felt that Austin Powers really sabotaged just the significance of Blofeld in the older Bond movies because he's got like the very, very bland suit, kind of the shortish stature and everything. And of course, just comes off like he's sort of the grand genius of everything. I think for me, what kind of caught me off guard since I haven't seen this movie in so long is I was just kind of like, wow, Wow, I didn't realize how goofy and cartoonish Blofeld's voice sounds. <laughs> yes. No, I absolutely agree, too. And this is a character that is supposed to be one of the most intimidating people that Bond will ever face. Like, and I'm here cracking up. Like, God, this guy sounds weird. What the hell? But again, I can imagine people in the 60s watching this going, oh, my God, that's so cool. But now that we have sat through and watched all the, the Austin Powers movies that lampoon this character specifically, it does show how goofy this character really is. And I guess that kind of fits well with the movie itself being a lot more goofy than any of the other movies. But if this is supposed to be the, the ultra villain of the entire film series, which he does end up being, I don't think this is a really good first impression. Honestly, kind of a terrible impression, to be honest, because it's just like, this, this is your guy, the guy who basically blew up a guy to death in Thunderball, and he's supposed to be super imposing and super scary, and yet here we are, we see him, he's got like a wicked scar in his eye, he's kind of shortish in stature, and he has a very goofy cartoonish supervillain voice i don't really see the fear that bond should be having yeah no absolutely so let me ask you something we had a comment on one of the videos this is a very true comment and i want to highlight this and he basically said that tropes aren't tropes if this is the film the film that started it so we've talked about a lot of the bond tropes that become kind of commonplace now, not only in Bond films, but in action films. Do you find it fair to criticize a movie based on the trope that it's been identified with? Or should it get a free pass because it's the movie that started the trope? Tropes aren't necessarily a bad thing. No. And I mean, and I fear this is what the person may be having concern with when I sort of mention the tropes. It's not that I feel that they're a bad thing. I definitely feel it's kind of one of those things of hey, it sort of sets up a recurring thing that we'll see in sort of modern day film and everything. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that it puts a bad light on things, but it's sort of the thing that does set up a trope that we end up kind of coming back to on occasion. I mean, like the Blofeld evil supervillain sort of trope. It's, it's fine. It's a little bit cartoonish, but I mean, it's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing though. He is correct that if something starts the trope is not necessarily a trope when they started it. That's true. But the thing with tropes are as well, some movies take those tropes and improve on them. And there's some movies that start a trope and they end up being the best part of that trope as well. A great example is, uh, I would say, there are some people that would say, like, The Godfather has some tropes as well. Organized crimes involving family, the patriarch being the, the head, something along those lines. Does that necessarily make The Godfather a bad movie because it started the tropes? No. There are other things along with those tropes 
that still make The Godfather really, really good. But the thing with art, though, and with uh, any kind of art, is that when it gets iterated on, most of the time it improves. And when they improve, then you get to look back and say, yes, this started it, but now it doesn't kind of work for today. Maybe not in the sense of, oh, it's offensive to our taste, but also it's been iterated upon so much at this point that there are better movies that do this. So it kind of seems lesser than. Give it its props, give it its flower. But with that being said, you still need to point out that yes, it's a trope. Yet yeah, it started the trope, but there are other movies now that do it so much better. Uh, that's my opinion on it. I, I get what the guy is saying too, with, that we are criticizing on things that it started. But on the other hand, if there are films that do it better, you can't just turn a blind eye and say, well, it started, so it gets a free pass. I don't really believe that. Zero, let's get into the Bond girls. Zero, there are two Bond girls in this movie. Oh my god. I know, we're getting spoiled for once. <laughs> I know. And they both kind of suck, unfortunately. The first one's Aki, who's played by Akiko Wakabayashi. I hope I got that right. Wakabayashi. Yeah, you got it right. All right. Yeah, you're rubbing off on me. Look at that. <laughs> you can ask Zero. I do these names so terribly. He's like, no, nah, it's actually this. Like, oh, shit. I didn't see the Y there. Anyway, so Aki... Aki is the first character that I think Bond is introduced to when he makes Japan. First, she's kind of interesting because she does outsmart him, but then she kind of falls for Bond really easily. And I mean really easily. Like one minute she's outsmarting him, the next they're sleeping together. And I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What did I miss? <laughs> like, hold on a second. <laughs> Presentation-wise, she's kind of a cute Bond girl. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Not like drop dead sexy like just the trope typically is for the bond girl uh, type cast but at the same time she doesn't have intensely magical chemistry with bond one of the major critical reviews when i was trying to do some supplemental research mm -hmm. said that she almost comes off like a guardian angel rather than sort of a lover to a sense and i can kind of see that uh, analog for the chemistry she definitely seems like she's always conveniently there when Bond needs him. Like when Bond's escaping Osato chemicals from being shot at, just bam, she's conveniently just right around the corner in her car. And she's like, hey, get in. <laughs> I think that's why just I can definitely see some folks kind of comparing Aki to more of a guardian angel type of character rather than like the super drop dead sexy and also deadly Bond girl type cast that we see in some of the later Bond movies. I mean, I, I would not say she's unattractive. I mean, she is very attractive in this movie, too. Like, uh, that, I guess I'm not trying to say that in the least, but I just think she's not that interesting. And I think also it's because she's not given much time to develop a character. But your point of her being like a guardian angel type is, I, I think, pretty accurate. And I think the only interesting thing about her is that she dies. That's really it. Is there anything else interesting about her? Not really. It's kind of interesting in the fact that just they have her die like kind of towards the uh, middle to the end of the movie and everything. And it's very unusual for Bond girls to end up biting the dust. I think one of the biggest and more recent examples of a Bond girl really just getting completely screwed out of things is Vesper in the Casino Royale movie with Daniel Craig. Mm -hmm. And that isn't towards the end. Like, right. right at the very end. But I would say for Casino Royale, that was to set up how Bond is throughout the entire series of films as well. Like, there was a good reason why she died in that movie, so... Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, there, uh, probably yeah. Are there, there probably are others that have two that we'll find later on, but this was just like, wow, she dies? Huh. So the other Bond girl is Kissy Suzuki, played by Mia Hone. Okay, so I mentioned that Aki doesn't have much there. Kissy doesn't have much at all in this movie. I mean, l let's put it this way, okay? I had to find the name of this character through IMDb because they do not mention this character's name in the movie. All I remember about her character at all was that Tanaka said her face makes her look like a pig. That's it. That's all I remember on this. I don't remember her name. I don't remember much of anything. Miyahama's character is just completely unreferenced by name. That was one thing, too, I was trying to figure out. I was just like, okay, did they ever give this pearl diving girl a name? Just, I know Tanaka went, like, nuts going, for this whole undercover plot where you're going to be turning Japanese, you're going to be marrying somebody who is part of a pearl diving village. And, yeah, she's got an ugly face, but, you know deal with it you're you're doing undercover shit so you know just don't harp on it so much mm -hmm. 
and that was pretty much it. I ended up having to do much like you, just research and double check. I was just like, okay, IMDB credits Miehama as playing Kissy Suzuki. Okay, that's interesting. And then, of course, because I had to watch the movie a second time to make sure I didn't miss anything, I was just like, ah, shit, they didn't even give her a name at all. What the hell? I know, right? <laughs> that's the thing that I was like, I was really scrambling my brain going, there must be some point where they said the name and I missed it entirely. Maybe this was a joke, but she ain't that ugly. Actually, I think she's rather cute. Am I, yeah. am I wrong on this? Or was this a joke that I missed? I think it's more sort of a joke because when Tanaka mentions the plan for Bond to go completely undercover and marry a pearl diving girl, his immediate reflex reaction was just like, yeah, i like to marry Aki, please. And then <laughs> Tanaka's was like, no. Um, you're gonna marry this ugly girl, so fucking deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was like, eww. <laughs> but both Bond girls kind of suck in this movie. And I don't think it's a, an issue with the actresses. It's more along the lines of, and I think it's the same thing with the villains as well. There's not much there. There really isn't much to really sink your teeth into about these characters. That's my issue with both Bond girls. I don't think it's the fault of the actresses, really. I think, really, the film and the script just did a bad job of giving them more character other than they help and or sleep with Bond. Okay, so let's get into spy action. There are some improvements compared to the uh, other Bond films, especially like Thunderball, but again, it's still uh, a few steps down from like Goldfinger and from Russia with Love. I don't mind the action so much in this. The action seems fine, and the green screen stuff still looks a little bit sloppy on this. The driving seats are, are definitely better. It, it mm. seemed like they kind of got a grasp of, okay, let's not make a humanoid character on the green screen like appear as the size of a windshield or something, kind of like what we saw in some of the other previous movies. But at the same time, some of the more ambitious green screen stuff, like the volcano base exploding at the end, is a little bit on the sloppy side. Sure, sure. I think really the big thing that I thought was pretty great was some of the car chase scenes where you have Aki just sort of zipping around the streets and not, not the green screen sections of the car chases, but when she's actively driving and just sort of helping Bond escape and everything. And interesting piece of trivia on the car too, the Toyota 2000 GT is actually a custom one-off because apparently Sean Connery was too damn tall to fit into the actual car and the production team had to basically go to Toyota and say, hey, do you mind making a special version uh, for us to use in this movie, one that has no roof on it, because we want to feature the car, but Sean Connery's not going to fit in the, into this car, and Toyota apparently came back with a really quick turnaround time going, yeah, yeah, sure, we can we can make you a custom one-off and just chop the roof off and everything. That's interesting, and that makes a lot of sense, too, considering how tall Connery is in this movie. I forget how tall he is. Was he, like, 6'3", six, 6'4"? Six, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I want to notate what you said on the car chase sequences. They're better in this movie. And I think I know why that is. I think they did a better job of editing the scene. There are scenes that are obvious. There are projection green screens in this movie. But they edit it tight enough where it's not as distracting. So it actually seems a lot better integrated into those scenes. Like with Dr. No, there was two. When you have so much time where you're obviously watching it, and it's obvious it's green screen or projector screens. Then it becomes like, uh, all right, well, sign of the times. What are you going to do? But the way they edit them, makes it a lot more fluid and makes it seem much more real. That's why it works better in this, even though it's using the same technology. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, I think it's done pretty well. I think the fight scene in Osato's building is actually pretty well done and is very entertaining. And then the other one with Blofeld's goon is also well done. I, I think another thing they do in that scene as well is they have the camera panned out a lot farther away in this so it's not as obvious that they're going through steps even though i think the one in osato's building is a much better fight scene the final fight scene in the volcano base is pretty dramatic as well too just from the scale of the invasion that tanaka's men basically mounts on it and it's kind of funny too because i think the Simpsons episode with Hank Scorpio sort of <laughs> uh, riffed off of that scene too. I was just like, man, oh man, I can see uh, where they got the inspiration for that scene now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, definitely the hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff in Osato's building with the one driver just realizing that he's been had and everything. 
That was a pretty good fight scene, and it felt very natural with a good flow to it as well, too. Mm -hmm. So I think just the hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography definitely felt like a improvement compared to, like, Thunderball and things like that. So why don't we get into gunplay since you mentioned the Hollow Out Volcano s sequence. I think the final scene has some pretty good gunplay. It's executed well. Sure, looked damn expensive, though. <laughs> we'll say that. It, it, <laughs> you can tell that looked expensive, but entertaining. I would say. Especially just from the fact that it just becomes a full-on invasion and everything with just Bond cleverly using the explosive cigarette too <laughs> because of course like it just Blofeld's just trying to give him the one-up going as you can see your allies are screwed no one can get into my base and then of course just kind of points out that the last thing Bond will see is just all of his friends end up dead and he can do that from the comfort of one of the TVs in the base. And Bond cleverly goes, may I smoke? <laughs> and you're just like, ah, oh, shit, here we go. Uh, here's the setup for just the turnaround at the base. And it's exactly w what you expect it to be. So let's get into gadgets. There's really only one, which is the Little Nelly, which is, uh, I looked it up. It's a Wallace Auto Gyro, but it's also equipped with all these weapons and gear. Now, if you look at this, like we talked about before, as this is just a goofy, silly, funny movie, it's not going to bother you so much. But the plane is kind of weird because would this plane actually be able to carry all the weaponry that's in this plane? <laughs> Like, there's flamethrowers, rockets, ammunition. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> like the, And if you look at this, it is a small-ass plane. The autogyrocopter is just comically small. I mean, I get it. Bond wants to be agile while, while he's scoping out an enemy base and everything. But, yeah, when just Q goes off with all these armaments, I'm just like, I get that we're supposed to suspend our belief for a little bit. But mm -hmm. I don't think ammunition from machine gun, forward-firing rockets, air-to-air heat-seeking rockets, and a rear mount flamethrower with the fuel for the flamethrower as well too are all going to magically fit into this auto gyro there's just no way <laughs> you would think that the air-to-air -air rockets that once they would actually get shot off that it would fly the plane off course with just the force of them so i i looked at it i was like this is weird what is this but like, it's a fun scene it's just like that you, you really have to suspend your disbelief regarding this gadget and this definitely feels like a slight ramp up to the gadgets where it's press button to win where oh i have this gadget and boom i'm out of a jam that's what it kind of feels like the start of in this with respect to the gadgets and everything i think they really wanted to flex more on just sort of Japanese sensibilities in gadget design this time around because when Tanaka ends up going, hey, you're going to have to go and live among the pearl diving people and everything. We need to get you gadgets that are sourced from us and uh, things that we can readily supply you with. And yeah, you see the exploding cigarette with, uh, with a rocket in it and everything. You have the rocket pistols where it shoots a rocket cartridge from the gun and everything it just seemed like they were really more focused on since we're doing stuff in japan let's do some stuff where just tanaka uses more japanese sensibilities and of course uh, you also had the moment when just the little nelly is deployed tanaka kind of gives q grief about it going oh my god is this some kind of joke are, are you deploying bond with some sort of toy here uh, what the hell are you doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it looked really weird. Overall, I think the action's not bad in this movie. It doesn't seem too bad. I think really the big step up are the driving sequences and the hand-to-hand -hand sequences. And the cherry on top is just sort of the dramatic gunfighting sequence towards the end on Blowfield's hidden volcano base. Final mission objective is the theme song and opening credits, which is You Only Live Twice, music by John Barry, lyrics by Leslie Bercosi, and performed by Nancy Sinatra. I'll keep it quick. These are not good. I don't like either. I, I think the song is kind of boring and unappealing, not catchy at all, and the opening credits, I think, are a big step down from, like, Goldfinger and even Thunderball. Like, I actually like Thunderballs, even though I I'm kind of mixed on the movie. But the opening sequence, I think, just doesn't look good. How about you? The opening sequence just seemed a bit more muted compared to some of the other Bond movies that we've seen thus far. I had to kind of kick myself awake a few times because I'm just like, wow, is it just me or is just this song just not catchy or just the hook isn't just biting into me or something? Maybe there's just something wrong with me on this one, but now sort of hearing your thoughts on it, I'm like, okay, well, never mind. I, I'm not totally fucking crazy. <laughs> no, no. I thought this song was droning. I was like, oh. 
God. And then on top of the the opening sequence not being very good. Yeah, that's a complete miss. All right, Zero. Overall, mission failure or mission accomplished? Mission accomplished, but not by very much. <laughs> I think really it's the action scenes that sort of make this movie a bit entertaining. Just with sort of weak villain portrayals, weakish Bond girls, it kind of brings the rating a bit down. So I'm not saying it's a mission accomplished by like a giant country mile or anything, but it's just a, all right, now we're barely scraping through with a mission accomplished. I have a mission failed on this. I ended up not liking this film very much. I think the first time I saw it, I thought this was just okay, but now that I'm watching it again, there are some major flaws in this, and it really goes into what r makes a Bond film really enjoyable, which are the villains and the Bond girl. Bond, as fun of a character as he is, is the straight man most of the time, so you would need interesting characters to populate his world, which are the villains, Bond girls, and stuff like that. When both the, the villains and the Bond girls aren't good, and you're just relying on the action, there's only so much action in the movie. Unless you want to make it a three-hour movie, you're going to have a pretty weak film. And I think that's exactly what happened in this movie. I think sending Bond to a very different country like Japan would have had a very interesting turn if it didn't feel so bland in this movie. Even Bond is not that interesting, not that fun in this movie. As much as I think the action is not bad, I, I can't recommend it. I think it's a mission failure. Uh, much like you, it might be okay to watch once, but yeah, it's all right. It's really the action that sort of barely makes it a passing movie for me. I can definitely agree that when the world building is a bit weak on this one, it's really a damn shame too because of the fact that it's Japan. Japan has a whole bunch of culture that's just very unique and they could have really ran away with it. And unfortunately it was just kind of a, oh, well, Japan, ah, set dressing, set dressing. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, you could have done so much more with this and I agree with you. But I guess where you just take it as it, it's mixed, but I give a slight recommendation. I'm kind of at that point where like, nah, I can't recommend it. Uh, it's a mission failure for me. Now, if you want my full review on this movie, you can go to my website at, at IamTheWiz.com. You'll have my full written review right on the site, along with a link to the video that has this review that you just listened to. Thank you for listening to this review. If you want to know what we're reviewing in the next couple days, you can look on the screen right now to see what's coming up next. If you like what you heard, go ahead and leave a like on this video. If you want to discuss your opinion on the film or the review itself, please leave a comment. And if you want to hear more, subscribe to the channel. Thank you again for listening. I will talk to you next time.